About a week ago, Netflix released Fuller House. Raise your hand if you have watched it. I'm very disappointed. <laughs> so for those of you who uh, don't know what Fuller House is, it's the sequel to Full House, a show that was on when I was a kid. It was part of TGI Friday. And the Full House kids in the remake, remake um, the kids DJ and Stephanie are all grown up and have kids of their own. So they move into their old childhood home and are raising their families together. Now, maybe it's in part because Full House has been on my mind, but as I pondered the scripture passage that we chose for this week, I kept seeing Uncle Joey on the original do his um, catchphrase. You, say it with me so that I don't feel like an idiot. Cut it out. Good. Some of you even know the motions. Good. So we have come to another one of Jesus's hard sayings in our Lenten sermon series. And actually in the passage that Rob read for us, we find a whole series of Jesus's hard sayings in this section of the Sermon on the Mount. These are sayings that we could spend a sermon on each one individually because they are all hard sayings. But today we're going to look at them all together as a group instead. The scripture passage today takes an interesting form where Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, don't murder, don't commit adultery, etc., followed by him saying, but I say to you, and then he intensifies the command. It was not uncommon for rabbis to use this form of teaching. The rabbi would lift up another rabbi's saying and say, you heard this said, but I say to you. The difference is that Jesus in this passage is in, instead of lifting up the teachings of another rabbi, Jesus lifts up the words of the Torah. Rather than contrasting his teaching with tradition or the teaching of other rabbis, Jesus contrasts his teaching with the Torah itself. No other rabbi would do that because scripture has the authority of God. Jesus, however, in doing this, is saying that because he is God, the authority lies with him first and within the text second. All of the parts of the Torah that Jesus highlights are parts that govern our relationships with each other and our communal lives together. One biblical scholar puts it this way. In each of these scenarios, Jesus is calling for an entirely new way of viewing human relationships. Behind the prohibitions lies the vision of a restored humanity. So for instance, Jesus takes the law prohibiting murder and then intensifies it. He says, if you are even angry, <coughs> excuse me, Dwight, could you go get me some water? Thank you. <coughs> excuse me. So he takes the, uh, if you are even angry with your brother, you will be subject to judgment and that calling someone an insulting name like you fool, how many of you have ever called somebody else a fool? Or something like it? Then every hand should be raised, right? Okay, so Jesus says, if you call someone an insulting name, that in and of itself can land you in hell. Now, I think I'm not the only one who has read that passage and thought, that punishment seems a little bit disproportionate to the offense. Jesus must not mean this passage literally because he himself uses the exact same word, moros, fool, to call the Pharisees blind fools. So Jesus isn't saying that you will be condemned to hell if you call someone a name, but what he is doing is connecting our anger and our name calling with murder. Jesus is warning us that it's a slippery slope. If we really want to stop murder, then we need to control our anger. Anger left unchecked leads to a breakdown in our relationships. When we are in the habit, thank you, when we are in the habit of calling each other names and putting each other down, it doesn't take long for it to progress from name calling to throwing punches. Excuse me. That's why Jesus says if you are offering a gift at the altar and realize that your brother or sister has something against you, you should stop what you're doing and go be reconciled to them. Jesus isn't literally suggesting <clears throat> that you stop in the middle of the sacrificial liturgy and make what was potentially a several day round trip to be reconciled to your brother or sister and then come back to complete the half finished liturgy. Instead, this is a way of saying that our call to reconciliation is even more important than an act of worship. That's how important God sees reconciliation between us. 
So Jesus goes on to talk about adultery and says that not only is adultery wrong, but so is looking lustfully on another woman. (coughs) I'm really sorry. I blame Bill. He got me sick. I'm just kidding. It was probably for my children. So Jesus goes on to talk about adultery and says not only is adultery wrong, but so is looking lustfully on another woman. This is essentially the same thing that Jesus is saying about murder. Our actions start as thoughts. We know from the story of King David and Bathsheba that adultery can start with a look that just goes unchecked. Indulging that look means that you are treating someone like an object instead of as a person. Jesus says this is such a serious offense that if you find yourself unable to stop looking, then you should cut out your eye. The original text actually uses the word pluck, which I find is um, much harsher than just cut out your eye. Now, an interesting side note about this passage is that this verse is one, uh, was one of the verses used that made an argument against translating scriptures into common language. Some of the priests who were a part of that original argument argued that common folks reading the Bible would never understand this passage and so would go around plucking out their eyes and cutting off their hands and so that we would be a whole world full of one-eyed, one-armed people. (laughs) Now, needless to say, you can look around the room and see that they turned out to be wrong. We can read this passage and not take it literally. Jesus is once again using hyperbole to say that if something is causing you to sin, especially if that something is causing you to hurt other people, then you should remove it from your life, no matter how important it is to you. We talked last week about the parallel passage from Mark's gospel about divorce and adultery. Jesus is really trying to lift up the original intent behind marriage rather than shaming people who have been divorced. (coughs) Excuse me. So the last section of the passage is about speaking the truth. And these are the verses that happen right after what Rob read. He says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Jesus isn't saying you should never swear an oath if, for instance, you are testifying in court. Rather, what he is saying is that you should be a person of integrity that speaks the truth whether you are under oath or not. That people should be able to trust what you are saying even if you are not under oath. (coughs) When we take a step back and look at all of these things together as a whole passage, it can feel really overwhelming. It's like Jesus is asking us to be perfect. Don't ever get mad. Don't ever call anyone names. Forgiveness and reconciliation should always be one of our highest priorities. Don't treat other people like objects or see them just as a means to your own comfort and pleasure. And live a life of truthfulness and integrity where your word is taken as simple, straightforward truth. Now, while that is really simple to name, it is actually really hard to live all of those things out. The more that I've pondered this passage this week, the more our current political scene keeps coming to mind. I think about the hatred and vitriol that some of our candidates are spewing out at every possible target. I think about the way that entire groups of people are being treated on both sides of the aisle as if they are objects rather than fellow humans made in the image of God. I think about the way faithfulness is treated like an old-fashioned, antiquated idea and almost as a sign of weakness. And I think about the way that truth has become a relative thing, where yes or no are rarely straightforward or simple. It saddens me to see this happening on the political level as our country decides who the next president will be, but what really saddens me is that what we see played out on nationally televised debates is in some way indicative of what is actually happening in our society. I think we only have to think about the phenomenon of reality TV to come up with examples of this. We're told through these shows that the reality is we can only find our future spouse along with a group of 34 other physically impeccable human beings on group dates that are anything but spiritually intimate and come out the other end with a lasting relationship. That's what it tells us. We're told that solving our dispute should look like yelling at the other person and not listening. We're told that it's okay to think the worst of people and actually say it because that's entertaining, which makes it okay. We're told that our worth is determined by how many votes we get or the number of likes we get on Facebook, and that we can make up our opinions without facts and make it truth as long as we say it loud enough. 
We're told that the world is made up of sound bites and that deep theological and ethical wrestling is not needed or wanted. And we're told that there are only winners and losers, only right and wrong, and we're told that it is impossible to disagree with others without also hating them. We're taught that the world is made up of us versus them and that we need to decide which side we're on. The picture that Jesus paints for us is just the opposite. It's also impossible and full of unfillable demands. That is, unless God's kingdom really has already broken into our world and unless Jesus really is the Messiah, our Savior. If we, friends, live like we truly believe that God's kingdom is on earth, then we will live with hearts that are quicker to forgive than they are to cut people out of our lives. If we live like we truly believe Jesus is our Messiah, then our every action would treat people as if they are children of God and not pieces of meat to be devoured. If we live as if we really believe that God's grace matters in our lives, then what we say with our words, we would actually live out in our lives. When we listen to what Jesus says in this passage and actually cut it out, that is, cut out all the bad behavior, when we stop simply fulfilling the letter of the law and instead start living into the beautiful idea of the way human relationships should work, that those laws were indeed written to protect, when we do that, we are a part of God's kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven. What's really awesome is that when we truly look around us, we can see pieces of this at work already. And that vision of what the world could look like when we cut it out helps us to empower us to take one more step towards faithful living. We see proof that God's kingdom is coming slowly but surely when we hear stories of utter forgiveness, like in the case of the Amish community who not only forgave their attacker, but physically loved the family that he left behind. We see pieces of it when folks from across the political spectrum come together to work for moments of peace and really get things done. We see a vision of God's kingdom when the time we spend in worship on Sunday mornings extends into the work in the community, work that really changes lives, and work that we allow to change us. So friends, let's step into the hard work that Jesus calls us to. Let us work to forgive easier, to see one another as God sees us, to seek re reconciliation and not live into hateful thinking. Let's let our yes be yes and our no be no. Let's live lives of steady faithfulness and loving truth so that one day God's kingdom may be fully realized here on earth as it is in heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.